picture this. You have a pet butterfly named Peter, and you two are really close. And one day, you decide to build a time machine and go back in time 50 years. Now, when you're there, your butterfly just wanders off somewhere, and you go to chase after it. Now, you observe that a dog, just random dog, is seeing the butterfly, and it goes to chase after it too. Now, the dog runs into a street, and it causes a car accident. Street and two cars. It, the two cars collide and cause a car accident. Now, inside the car, there happens to be a serial killer who is now dead. So, all this because of the accident, which was caused by the dog, who was chasing a butterfly, who was just wandering around. Thousands of people are now not going to die. All this because of a butterfly. Hi, my name is Suyok Joshi, and I'm 15 years old, and I'm from Ontario, Canada. Now, the above example I just gave you is an example of the butterfly effect, an effect which states that a small change in this period of time can cause dramatical results in a later period of time. Now, but the butterfly effect is related to chaos theory in the sense that chaos theory is basically a fractal mathematics, a field in fractal mathematics that has dynamical systems that show a pattern which repeats itself. So it's going in a continuous loop which is repeating itself. So uh, this chaos theory was first developed by an American mathematician named Edward Lorenz. Um, and he was just experimenting with Earth's weather patterns and he came to know this. Now, the most common example of this butterfly effect is that a butterfly flaps its wings, let's say in New Mexico, and years or a certain period of time later, there's a hurricane or a tornado in China. Now, if the butterfly had not flapped its wings at the right point in space, t space or time, the hurricane would not have happened. Now, the main thing in chaos theory is unpredictability. We can never know for certain or we can never predict for 100% sure that something's going to happen in a complex system. Now, a complex system uh, it consists of many different types of loops or patterns. So, we cannot, a naked eye cannot spot a pattern for that. That's why you use different te techniques. So, let me give you an example. So, here's a coin, and I flip it, and I catch it. Now, I can never know for 100%. I can I cannot be like, I'm 100% sure that this is going to be heads or tails. I have a 50-50 chance of getting it right, but I can never know for certain. So, when I look now, it's heads. So, I wouldn't have known that without knowing all the properties that affect this, this coin. For example, the force of my flick, or the the air pressure in this room, or the size of this coin, etc. I could not have known where this is going to land, heads or tails, if it weren't for all those things in this room. So, now, chaos theory is closely related to fractals. Now, what are fractals? I've mentioned to you this before, but what are fractals? Well, fractals in mathematics are never-ending patterns. They go around, go around in a continuous sequence, keep on going, and they, they never tend to stop. So, it's something that, something that is simple and goes around in a continuous loop. Now, why are fractions important? Well, because chaos the theory is really uh, close to self-similarity. And self-similarity is the concept that you can take a small part of something and you can repeat it over and over again, and it's still going to be the same, same object. But if you take a small part of that object and zoom in, it's, you basically have the whole thing, the whole shape, the whole figure that you were planning to draw in the first place. Now, let me, let me give you an example for this. So now, I'm going to be giving you an example of the Cook Snowflake. Now, the Cook Snowflake is basically a pattern. It's, it's a self-similarity pattern. So, uh, this was discovered by the early um, Swedish mathematician named Helge von Cook. So, he basically took a triangle, he flipped it around and put a, another triangle over top. Now, you can see how it forms six different smaller triangles on the outside. So, what he did was he took upside down triangles and placed them all over the outside smaller triangles. And that created a self-similarity pa pattern. Now, you could do this all day for smaller and smaller, and you could do this all around, but it would never it would never stop, and it would keep on going until you can't do it anymore. So, now, let me just take this one right here, this triangle, and enlarge it this here, and this is going to be a triangle. It's going to be the same thing. So, you can keep doing this over and over again, and you're going to get the same figure that you started off with. Now, this is an example of self-similarity. Well, why is self-similarity important, you ask? Well, self-similarity is all around us. 
whether you find that in the trees of the branches or the Romanesco, but, uh, the Romanesco broccoli, which are made up of buds, of smaller buds, and smaller buds, and even smaller buds. The early ca uh, chaos theorists discovered that even complex systems, like the coin I showed you, even complex systems have some kind of a pattern or some kind of loop in it. So they, they weren't sure for certain, so they smushed it all down to a graph, and they did see some kind of pattern. So they, they thought that this was some kind of an equilibrium, so they call this an attractor. Now, you, m you may have heard this term before, attractor, and I'm going to be talking about another example of this attractor. Imagine that there is a town, this town, and it has 10,000 people in it, and to satisfy these 10,000 people's needs, the governor has, the government has opened up um, a supermarket, one supermarket, two swimming pools, three libraries, and four churches, for example, let's say. And these people are happy with this. It's an equilibrium. So now, imagine that there's an ice cream, ice cream plant on the outskirts of the town, and it opens up job for additional 10,000 more people. Now, these, this town has to adjust, adjust, this town has to handle 10,000 more people, so this becomes to 20,000. And this 20,000 is not equal to this. So, because th this was for only 10,000 people. So, this 20,000, the government has to open another s one supermarket, two swimming pools, three e libraries, and four churches. And this is equal. So now, this is what an attractor is. This is eventually going to stop, eventually going to stop, this pattern is eventually going to like, come to a conclusion, and they're not going to be repeated anymore, or never going to continue anymore. So, this is what an attractor is. Now, let me give you an example, and this time I really want you to visualize, or come up with some kind of pattern if you can, and think about what I'm drawing. So, imagine with the same town, we have 10,000 people, and this is the town. And to fit these needs, we have, again, the same thing we had before. And, now this time, instead of adding people, we're going to take away people. We're going to take away... Uh, Let's say we're going to take away 3,000 people, and that's going to leave us with uh, that's going to leave us with 7,000 people. Now, the 7,000 people is happy with this, but these people who run the supermarkets or whatever are not happy because the supermarket um, bosses came to a conclusion that without having at least regular 8,000 customer, at least 8,000 customers, we cannot function. We cannot. We cannot like. We, get, we, cannot, we cannot have profit with that. So they decide to close down and leave. Now, demands continue to rise and these people are left without gro groceries. Now, another company hears about this and they decide to open up a new supermarket here, hopefully to attract some new some people, which they do, but the, urgent, the, the people, some people decided to leave this town because there were no groceries. So these people, those people who decide to leave the town are not going to be uh, uh, biased because there's going to be a new supermarket opening. Their decision is already fixed that I'm gonna leave this town and go somewhere else where there's groceries. Now, this is an example of a strange attractor. Now, what's the difference between a strange attractor and an attractor? Well, the main difference is that strange attractors goes from condition to condition to condition to condition and it never stops, but it's still some kind of an equilibrium. So, it still keeps on going. But attractor changes from condition, condition, and stops. Now, this is still an equilibrium, and it's a, a, good, a good equilibrium. So this isn't what an attractor and a strange attractor is. So now, this, all, this whole concept I just talked about ties back to the chaos theory and the butterfly effect. Well, why is it important? Well, it's important because it tells us we have an impact on the future. All of us, we are doing stuff that can eventually impact the future in a big way possibly. For example, you might even throw the candy wrapper in the garbage and that you might think, okay, yeah, that's just going to go to the garbage. But it, who knows, there's going to be a lot of unlikely scenarios that you not, you're not even going to predict that's eventually going to come up with something big. You never know. Me delivering the speech to you guys, who knows? I, this might even lead to be dramatically affected in the future somehow. We never know. We can never predict. That's how the strange attractor works. So you might have seen some popular medias based on the butterfly theory, butterfly effect and the chaos theory, the butterfly effect movies, the chaos theory movie, etc. So now, the second reason why it's important is because chaos theory is all around us. Wherever we look, it's, it's chaos theory. You can never, you cannot predict something in nature or in communities or societies, etc. So this is why I want to talk about chaos theory, because it's really important. Thank you.